Inspiration doesn't come close to describing Kurt Fernley. Farlap's tick as a P in comparison. Born without the lower portion of his spine, Kurt has smashed all obstacles on the path to achieving his goals. A fierce natural competitor, he has an unrivaled list of sporting achievements. Have a listen to this. Three Paralympic gold medals, seven Paralympic silver medals, two Commonwealth Games gold and silver, over 30 marathon victories, a Sydney to Hobart yacht race win, and in 2009, Kurt crawled the Kokoda track. Pushing the limits is what Kurt has done his entire life, and he's inspired the nation while he's done it. Kurt, it's an honour to have you on the show tonight. Welcome to the session. I know after hearing some of Fletcher's jokes, you're a little concerned about it. <laughs> <laughs> I am shifty in my seat. Uh, <laughs> I tend to start with Kurt. I, I just want to read an excerpt from your book to give viewers an insight into the type of competitor I'm interviewing here tonight. Now, this is not you racing for a gold medal. This is you on board the Sydney to Hobart yacht race. Uh, a boat, uh, your boat's leading. You've just entered the Derwent River uh, around Hobart. Finishing line is in sight. But uh, suddenly the mighty wild oats is closing in on you, blokes, and they just metres away. This is what you say. I wanted to beat them so badly. At that moment, I hated wild oats. There was no thought that their crew was actually human, just a bit of combatant. That's how my mind worked, wanting to grind an opponent into, into the ground until he was physically unable to keep going. I wanted to be the reason why my opponent cracked. I wanted to be the reason why he lost the will to push on. You're an evil bastard. <laughs> <laughs> i got some issues. Yeah. <laughs> where, does that, where does that fire come from? Oh, but I, I love sport. I've been in sports since, well, I think from the moment I, I crawled out of the cots, court sport was always around me. And I, in, in racing, you, you just, there's so many elements to it and I found so much joy in it and so much time that I put into it that it, mm. it just went across to that comp. And literally, I felt like I wanted to curl up into a ball and be shot like a cannon at Wild Oats. You know, they were, yeah. they were just the enemy on that day. And... 58 yeah. hours worth of work and we were, we were within inches or, or metres or minutes from the line. You just wanted that win. And you got them. We, we did. You got them. You got them. Unbelievable. Yeah, yeah When mate. don't you win? Yeah, well, that's... The, my, my brother called me up and said, you are the luckiest bastard that I've ever seen. Because <laughs> he knows I'm no sailor. There's no yacht clubs at Carcor, mate. What about... Um, <laughs> we'll get to the town of Carcor in a minute. Your book is just... It's outstanding. Um... It's, it's really hard to, to formulate an interview in, in 15 minutes because there's so much you've achieved. So we're going to hand pack some moments. But just on that Sydney to Hobart win, um, the experience, you went on there without your wheelchair, OK? There wasn't room for it on the boat. Uh, what happened that first night? About six hours in, uh, the, the 10 of our 22 crew would become seasick, chronically seasick. And my job was simple. And, and really, the story of Sydney Hobart was Anthony Bell sitting down and telling me that I could get on that boat, that he thought I was going to be the best in the world at what he was going to ask me to do. And I crawled around the pit, which is only about three by three metres squared. And we sat there and we broke this job down. We spent days figuring out what, he looked, what it would look like. The thing he didn't tell me about was that when they were so sick and they couldn't go up the stairs, they would vomit directly into my pit. And he didn't tell me how slippery the combination of vomit and fibreglass actually is. Oh. For 30 hours, there were people just, just so crook that they would vomit, disappear, and then to do my job, I had to crawl through it. And, oh. you know, you were for, for, for a good 30 hours, you were covered in vomit. But what I did, I'd, I'd just do my job in it. And, Look, if my job is to crawl around in other people's vomit to get the job done, then, you know, that's just the cost of doing the job. The, mm. the opportunities that I get that are so far out in the fringe of what my community are actually even allowed to do, yep. that when I get given them, it's a gift, and I remind myself of that, and I say that I'm repping every single one of them, and I've got to nail it every time. You're, uh, you've got a great rugby league lineage in your family. Um, uh, Greg Fernley, he was part of the 1974 AMCO Cup side, the, the great fairy tale where they won the uh, AMCO Cup, were 500 to 1, 200 to 1 outsiders. Greg the Butcher Fernley. Big front rower, fearless <laughs> yeah. front rower. Uh, but your uncle Terry, the late Terry Fernley, he, uh, not just a great player, but a great coach. The first, the first man to coach a New South Wales uh, state of origin winning side in 85. And then he took over the... The funny story, he took over the, uh, the Australian side in 85, and when they went to New Zealand, 
dropped every Queenslander in the team <laughs> except Wally. What a legend. Yeah. <laughs> What did he say about that? He did say he made one mistake, and that was keeping Wally. <laughs> <laughs> Look, we loved that. I grew up loving that, loving that contest and loving Origin. I think my entire family, we live and die by the Origin season. It's bigger than the club. Mm. Um, Uncle Terry, we did lose him the other day, and well, yeah. a couple of years ago. His daughter got up and gave a eulogy, and it was beautiful. He spoke about how Uncle Terry lived by three simple things, and it was... If you're going to do a job, you make sure you do it to the best of your ability. Uh, you always look after your family. And third and final, probably the governing rule was never, ever trust a Queenslander. <laughs> <laughs> we'll pass it on to Gordon. <laughs> we have to say that. Uh, all right, let's talk about your racing. Gold medal set records in the 400, 800, 1500, 5000, 10,000. But you gravitated towards the marathons. Why, Kurt? Uh, I was probably about, when I was 17, I packed up the car and left, left home, left Carcor and drove down to Sydney and I knew that my life would head in that direction and if I was going to be racing wheelchairs, I wanted to be the toughest and, you know, if you commit your life to do it, you always know the most interesting road's the long one and the difficult one and, you know, it just seemed a little, seemed a little boring to choose anything other than that. So. Yeah. I, I chose the marathon and uh, I, four years or five years later, I, I won my first race, which just happened to be the Athens Paralympic Games. And from then on, mate, it was just, that was, that was part of who I was. Do you enjoy pain? It's a funny relationship with pain because you, 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 you've got an outcome and you're looking for it and, and pain's something that you've got to eat to get there. And yeah, you've, you've got to find some joy in it because there's no, there's no looking away from it. Like, it's, you're just not going to get where you want to go without going through that, that period. So you need to find a way to, to, to give yourself a little, a little bit of joy while you're doing it because especially if you're there for the 20-year time, mm. the long game, then, mate, you're just, you're just not going to be cut for it. Kurt, I, um, we asked you of all your victories which one was one of the most special. You nominated the Commonwealth Games 2018, uh, the C54 Marathon. Why, why that one? Oh, you, you, I was just in a completely different space and I'd, I'd lost... Uh, I'd lost... I'd come second place 16 times. No, just under. Just under 16 times to one guy for two and a half years. And it was just killing me. And I got to the Com Games and firstly I was grateful that my competitor was a Swiss athlete. I was grateful that Switzerland isn't in the in the bloody Commonwealth. <laughs> <laughs> I almost let one slip there. Don't worry. Uh, yeah, but my family were there, my entire community was there, Karkul was there. I had like a hundred Fernleys around me. I had within 60 seconds of that. And I nailed that race. I had an average heart rate at 195 beats per minute for one hour and 32 minutes. I had the moment that you hope for, that you get the biggest stage that sport can give you, and I just I nailed it. And within 60 seconds of crossing that finish line, uh, I had my six-month-old in one arm and my four-year-old in another, and my wife next to me, and that's what it's all about, mm. you know, sharing those incredible moments, those real beautiful moments with the people you love. People who push themselves as hard as, as you do, it's either a byproduct of being poked or just encouraged, and uh, you mentioned the town of Karkul. 200 people you grew up. Uh, reading the book brings a tear to your eye how much that town loves you. And, you know, the, what they did for you when, you know, for your first racing chair, you know, they wrote, that town raised $10,000 for the chair and to send you to the States. Yeah, see, there's towns and there's, there's deeds like uh, what, what Karkul gave me echoing all around the, the country, and I know they're there, and I, uh, I was the beneficiary of 200 people telling my family when when I found sport when I was about 13, they started raising money and in two weeks they raised 10 grand. And my family, we weren't the most financial family, but my family still tried to stop it because it was it was yeah. a little uh, uh, confronting. Yeah, yeah sure, yeah. And the, the town, literally, they stood up and said, you stay out of it. It's between us and the boy. And that town, they're, they're forever my family. And, mm. and I think people, you do good things. You, you know, you, you make things possible when community comes together. And, and sometimes it does cost us money, but when you, when you give people opportunity, when you, when you give them that path and they take it, and that person, when they... You know, if you are that person, if you are that kid, make sure you always remember that moment because that's... You are their work at heart, you know? 
What is it that you have, Kurt, because uh, reading the book, when I started to read your book, I thought, OK, this is going to be a book about overcoming adversity. Mate, it's a book about love. Wherever you go, people love you, whether it was, which we'll talk about in a minute on the Kokoda track, whether it's the town of Karkul, your fellow Olympians, everywhere. What, what is it that I feel you... my competitors didn't think much of me. <laughs> yeah. What is it? What, what is... What's the magic? Oh, mate, I, I think there's... It's hard. I, I don't know, mate. I, I, you don't really know how... I know that I got pretty overwhelmed with the amount of feedback I got through the Commonwealth Games and it was real, extremely just loving. And, look, I think people... I think people like gratitude and... Um, and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm talking to people at the moment about what it is to be an Australian and that idea of gratitude just keeps coming up. Mm. And also remembering where you come from. And, look... Uh, I, I will be buried as the boy from Karkor. I'm an Ovacastrian now, but, mm. you know, making sure that those people that gave that moment to you, that, that making sure that mm. they're always with you, I think the love isn't just for me, it's for Karkor, because yeah. that really is... It's kind of the heart and soul, and that's who we believe we are, and, and people feel it and people believe it, and I, I'm just the... I guess I'm just the recipient of most of it. Kokoda, the first man to... Crawl the Kokoda track. Well, there was uh, Corporal, there was Corporal John Metzen, and that, it was one of the stories I read that just thought, you know what, I've got to do it. Um, Corporal John Metzen was uh, was injured through both ankles, and he crawled backwards for two and a half weeks, and refused help. And I didn't refuse help. My trip was about going over there with people, being able to look up and ask for help whenever I whenever I needed it. That that moment there, even just saying and looking to my brothers or family or whoever was around me and saying I was really struggling, that gave me a lot of strength. But John Metzen crawled backwards for two and a half weeks, refused help, would have been eating grains of rice, you know, bullets flying over between his ears, and he was eventually taken over and was executed during that battle. But for two weeks, a guy crawled. With, with very little but hardship in his in his uh, in his life, mate, and you know where yeah. things are possible. Yeah. Your uh, parents had a lot of reservations about it. Um, about yeah. you. Did, did you have reservations before you did? Oh, I had a lot of fear. Uh, I, I controlled that fear. I, I'm not a big fan of fear, mm. um, but when it pops up, I make sure that I that I treat it with respect. Uh, it was going to be a hundred k through mud, and uh, I, I took eighteen months and. I crawled around Newcastle. I, th I still laugh at the like days. Joey John's back in the day. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, you said you yeah, no, no. no. <laughs> Crawling through boxes. <laughs> so, uh, look. <laughs> I do laugh. I used to go to the corner of Glenrock Reserve and I would turn my wheelchair over and I would just just crawl in one direction for three hours. And I wonder how many bushwalkers just walked along and went, holy crap! <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it was a see, long time and small steps. Body was covered in blisters. Uh, they, you know, they can open wounds. Is it... Uh, you said it was like dragging yourself through a meat grinder every day. Was it, is that the, the... Doing the Kokoda track, was that the toughest thing you've ever done? Oh, mate, it was brutal. It was yeah. really brutal. Like, every... Every night, and probably the hardest part was every night at, at three o'clock I'd finish up and then you'd have to lay there and, and the local boys, mate, the, the, the PNG people, so one of the most fierce but just caring and loving, gentle people that you could meet, um, I would lie there and they would just wash me, like they would strip me off and I was a stinking mess and they would have a bucket of water and, and, and wash me off and it was just... You know, those three hours or those six hours from when I'd stop to go to sleep, they were tough. Um, tell me about the work you're doing in Africa, in Kenya. Yeah, mate, since it's nice to be a has-been wheelchair racer. Um, I've been able to look after a few of the charities doing great work. One was Humpty Dumpty just today. They'd had the Balmora burn. Uh, I'm doing a little bit of work this week. The 500 Club down in Melbourne raised $300,000 for a school over in Africa. Mm. It's got the Kurt Fernley Centre in, 70 kids with disabilities receiving their first days of education. Uh, mate, one of the most rewarding, beautiful parts of my life. You're one of the great competitors we've had on this show. We've had people like Andrew Johns, Brett Kenny, and one of the things they talk about in retirement is problematic uh, for champions in retirement because that fire in the belly, Kurt, just doesn't disappear. Um, and it leaves a big hole. What next for you? Look, there is that idea. There is that idea of being really so good at that run, getting in your chair and feeling perfect at it. But I've got to the place now where there is so much outside of my sport that I love as much. And, uh, you know, we've been able to get uh, uh, 400 people with disabilities employed across Crown Resorts. And this, the perfect moment now just looks completely different. A uh, perfect moment for me is 
sitting down with the kids and being in the bush. You know, it's mm -hmm. just, it happened at the right period of time and, mate, I have so much gratitude for actually having been given the 20 years that I did racing to ever look back on that and want more. Supporting the Knights these days? <laughs> yeah. Because you were a Panthers fan. I, I am, You dropped mate. off them at the right time. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I still watch the Penrith game, but uh, I, I love Newcastle. And 90% of the games that I watch are up there. And uh, it's handy that they're going well. But there are a couple of young Fernleys coming through the age ranks out at Panthers. So I'll be a traitor again. As long as they don't, if one ever pulls on a Queensland jersey, mate, that will break my heart. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> but yeah. look, mate, league's good. League taught me a lot. Yeah. League taught me about getting back up and having another crack, so. What a champion. Kurt Fernley, thanks for coming on, mate. Appreciate it.